and welcome to the final episode in this playlist on biomes. If you started this playlist at the very beginning, then you've listened as I've explored the oceans and all of the ways that life lives and thrives in marine ecosystems. You listened as I moved onto dry land, transitioning across the coastlines, the swamps and marshes, and going upriver to lakes and ponds. At this point, I moved fully onto dry land, and the next episode explored the grasslands and the xeric landscapes of savanna and desert. While sticking to this theme of low moisture and high aridity, I turned the thermostat from hot to cold and explored the wintry boreal forests and the arctic tundra of the far north. I explored briefly the polar ice caps and how these are home to delicate, animal-based ecosystems. Then I moved back southward, coming out of the boreal forests into the temperate forests. I explored the expanses of conifer and deciduous forests, and how, at certain places with certain climates, these temperate forests can become rainforests. And this takes me to the last kind of forest on the planet, the last major group of biomes that I want to talk about, and these are the topic of today's episode. These are the tropical forests, the dense, verdant jungles between 30 degrees latitude north and south, with unparalleled biodiversity and density of vegetation. The tropical plants of a tropical forest can be organized into four layers. The tallest layer is called the emergent layer because it includes only a few species of tree that can grow anywhere from 45 to 75 meters tall, which makes them emerge out of the canopy and rise up beyond it. The canopy layer itself is usually 30 to 45 meters up, and within this region, the forest is packed with life. Birds of all kinds make their homes in the branches, like the rainbow-billed toucan with its black body, yellow throat, and vividly colored beak, or the scarlet macaw with its short, flat beak and bright red, yellow, and blue feathers. A huge portion of the life in the canopy comes in the form of epiphytes, which are a unique type of organism that lives on the outer surface of a plant, like on its bark or on top of its branches. Except the epiphyte doesn't parasitize the host plant. The epiphyte doesn't feed off of its host plant at all. These epiphytes just use the host plant as a substrate or a physical structure upon which to grow while getting their nutrients from rainwater or detritus, like dust in the air. There are tens of thousands of different species of these epiphytes that live in the tropical rainforest canopy. And below the canopy is the understory. And the understory in a tropical forest is pretty similar to the understory of a temperate or boreal forest. The understory contains shrubs and small trees and other medium-sized plants that live in the semi-shaded area immediately below the canopy. The understory is relatively dark, because the canopy blocks out up to 95% of the incoming sunlight. As a result, the plants that live in this understory have to deal with this low light. Some of these plants have adapted to have huge, broad leaves that are dark with heavy concentrations of chlorophyll. These heavy-duty leaves have evolved so as to be able to grab any glimmer or burst of light that makes it through the canopy. Any drop of light is critical to these plants, and so anything that comes through, their leaves have to be equipped to, to grab that light and process as much of it as possible. But despite this, and other adaptations to adjust to this low-light environment, the low light really does hamper the growth and vitality of the stuff that lives under the canopy. The plants in the understory really don't get very tall. Usually they're less than 10 feet tall, or less than about 3 meters, and they don't grow particularly dense. Vegetation is even less dense on the forest floor, as this lowest layer of the forest gets less than 2% of the sunlight. The few plants that live here are all very shade tolerant, and because of the darkness and the humidity, fungus thrives. This plethora of fungus in the tropical forest, combined with the heat and the humidity, means that dead stuff will decay really fast. Surprisingly, the soil layer is actually really thin in a tropical forest, because this wide variety of fungus and microbes, enabled by the heat and humidity, will break down detritus in a matter of days, and the remains will get rapidly absorbed or eaten by other organisms, 
be they some kind of plant that's absorbing the decayed nutrients, or be they some kind of insect, or scavenging mammal, or something like that that consumes the rotting detritus in chunks. But the fungus and these shade-tolerant plants are typically small and soft, and so they're both easily stepped over. And this is good for animals, as the relative lack of vegetation on the tropical forest floor allows larger animals like leopards, gorillas, wild boars, rhinoceros, elephants, and snakes to move relatively easily through the forest. Some of these larger animals, like rhinoceros and elephants, are able to push away any vegetation that's in their way. So they're not necessarily too limited by dense vegetation, like a, a dense forest. They can push through the trees, knock trees over, push through the grasslands, wade through wetlands and lakes, but I digress. These tropical forests are the most densely inhabited regions of the planet, with more species of insects, plants, fungi, and vertebrate animals per cubic meter than almost any other ecosystem or habitat on Earth. These tropical forests are home for half the animal species on the planet, and half the plant species, including more than two-thirds of all flowering plants, of all angiosperms. These tropical forests are so verdant and dense with life because of their geographic position on the planet. These tropical forests exist along the equator, where things are very stable. At the equator, there's about 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness, and this doesn't really change with the seasons. There's little to no seasonal temperature shifts or day-night cycle shifts. The biggest seasonal change that the local life has to deal with is a seasonal change in humidity, whether it's the wet season or the dry season. This is a good time to clarify that not all tropical and subtropical forests are steamy, foggy, wet jungles. I mean, some of these tropical forests are. Some of them absolutely are the stereotypical, verdant, heart of Africa jungle. Most of them are. More than 60% of the world's tropical forests are these wet forests, whether they exist in Africa or South America or Southeast Asia or wherever. But about 40% of these tropical forests are dry or seasonally dry forests. These tropical dry forests exist all over the world. The northern half of Madagascar is tropical dry forest, as is the western third of Mexico and much of Mesoamerica. Dry forest also exists in the heart of South America, running immediately south of the Amazon rainforest and along the eastern edge of the Andes Mountains. Much of India is also carpeted in this tropical dry forest, as is a large chunk of Southeast Asia. The seasonal humidity and dryness is perhaps the most important variable that influences the evolution of plants in these tropical climates. The sunlight is pretty regular, be it on a daily cycle or on a seasonal cycle. The temperature is also pretty steady, both day and night and across the seasons. But some areas get a lot of water year-round, while others will only get seasonal rains. In an evolutionary context, this makes a profound difference in life strategies and the adaptations that plants and animals use to survive. The driest tropical forests are typically composed of deciduous trees like teak and bamboo, as these can lose their leaves during the dry season. These dry seasons are long, months-long droughts, and it can be really hard for trees to survive these periods of water stress if they retain all of their leaves. If they keep all their leaves on, the leaves will increase the tree's surface area tremendously, and they serve as a point for water loss through transpiration. Because these trees can't afford to lose water during the dry season when water is rare enough as it is, they simply lose their leaves, like other deciduous trees do in winter at higher latitudes. There are conifer trees in the tropical dry forests, although these conifers tend to exist more where there's at least a little residual humidity. They live where the dry season isn't too harsh, or where rainfall might sputter along for most of the year, even if it's in fits and bursts and not like monsoons. Or they live where there's enough groundwater that can sustain them in the absence of rain. Evergreens can't lose their needles seasonally, so they're always losing water through transpiration. In the driest areas, in the driest biomes, 
This absolutely prohibits their growth, as they just can't hang on without enough water. But in the slightly moister, dry tropical forest areas, they are able to eke out an existence. For example, the riparian zone in a dry forest is often particularly dense, as the river water will moisten the soil, so the entire riparian corridor is water-rich, even during the dry season. During the wet season, the rivers often flood, and the riparian zone widens as entire floodplains get watered and then see a subsequent explosion in vegetable growth. Because the dry tropical forests are often composed of deciduous trees that lose their leaves every dry season, the tree canopy isn't particularly thick. In the wet season, the tree's leaves are out in full, and the canopy is quite dense. Most light is blocked from reaching the forest floor, and only a few shrubs and grasses are able to persist on the ground. But when the dry season comes, the deciduous trees will lose their leaves, and all of a sudden, all of that thick, dense canopy is gone. There aren't any leaves to block the light, and the ground gets illuminated and warmed by the sun. Suddenly, being a shrub on the forest floor isn't so bad, and there's a small burst of growth from the shrubs and grasses and the other smaller, low-lying plants on the tropical forest floor. In this way, the growth of biomass in the dry tropical forests shifts seasonally between the tree canopy and the bushy undergrowth of the forest floor. The trees will grow in the wet season. Well, technically all the plants will grow in the wet season, but the trees will grow the most. And then the dry season will come, and the trees will lose their leaves, the canopy will disappear, and the plants on the ground will experience their own little burst of growth. Then the wet season comes back again, the trees will grow out their leaves, the canopy will return, and life on the ground will fall again back into the shade. The wetter, more humid tropical forests include the mixed tropical and the monsoon forests, or the tropical seasonal forests, which still have cyclical wet and dry seasons, but are generally much more humid and better hydrated than a typical dry forest. A lot of the tropical forests in India and Mesoamerica could be called mixed forests, which receive more than a thousand millimeters, or more than 40 inches, of annual rainfall. Most of this rainfall occurs during the summer months, when the northern and southern trade winds meet and mix at the intertropical convergence zone. During the warm, wet summer, this convergence zone moves northwards, depositing rain onto the tropical forests below. And during the winters, the zone moves southward, pulling a lot of moisture south and away from the seasonal tropical forests. The wettest, most humid forests are the tropical rainforests, which exist within a thin belt, about 20 degrees latitude in width, centered on the equator. These tropical rainforests are the true jungles, because they experience extremely heavy rainfall throughout the year, on the order of 2,000 millimeters, or 80 inches of rain, annually. The day-night cycle of a tropical rainforest is pretty much exactly equal. 12 hours of light, 12 hours of darkness, because these forests sit right on the equator. Here, they receive more or less direct sunlight, which provides the light energy to support the dense jungle ecology. It also makes these rainforest biomes really hot. Temperate rainforest is pretty much always hot, even at night, because the humidity in the air holds on to the heat that's been accumulated during the day. On top of all this, the climate is very stable. There are no summers. There's no winters. There is no spring and fall. There's just one perpetual season, with ample sunlight, warm winds, and lots of rain. Across the whole world, there's three primary regions that are characterized by this dense tropical rainforest. You have the Amazon River Basin and the surrounding areas in South America, which I'll only briefly cover as I've talked about it in previous episodes. There's the Congo River Basin in the heart of Africa, and the jungles of Southeast Asia and the Malay Archipelago. Alright, so let's start with the tropical forests of Southeast Asia, with the jungled-covered islands of Indonesia and Malaysia, and the tropical wetlands of Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam, and the rainforest-covered hills of Laos and Myanmar. 
The southeastern corner of Asia is an absolute thicket of tropical forest that's just exploding in biodiversity. These tropical forests are home to a variety of strange and even carnivorous plants, like the family of pitcher plants called the Nepenthesaea. These pitcher plants grow literal pitchers, or cups, out of thin, leafy tissue. Within the cavity of this pitcher, or cup, at the very bottom, they produce a kind of thick goo, or a syrup, which retains its sticky viscosity even after it's been diluted by rain falling into the pitcher. The pitcher itself has a brightly colored rim, or outer lip, which attracts insects. But this lip, or the, the rim of the pitcher, is covered in a slippery, waxy layer, which means the insects can't get a stable foothold when they land on the lip. The unfortunate insect will land on the lip of the pitcher plant. They'll try and stabilize themselves, but they won't be able to. They'll slip, and they'll fall in, scraping at the sides of the pitcher plant that also have this slippery, waxy layer, and eventually they fall into the sticky pool of fluid at the very bottom. The fragile wings of the insect are effectively destroyed as the bug struggles against the fluid, and eventually it will die of exhaustion. The insect's body is dissolved, and the nutrients are absorbed and metabolized into the plant's tissues. So, in a very literal sense, these are carnivorous plants. And it's not like they're very discriminating. You know, it, it's not like they only eat insects. Any kind of animal that happens to fall inside the pitcher might get dissolved, be it a small rodent, a tiny little bird, or a little lizard. These pitcher plants will eat it all. The southeastern Asian jungles are also home to elephants, boars, deer, wild ox, bears, rhinoceros, monkeys, leopards, water buffalo, Komodo dragons, and hundreds of other species of vertebrate animals. This number pales in comparison to the number of species of plants and fungi, and this in turn pales in comparison to the number of insect species. Vietnam and Laos are in one of the most biodiverse regions on the planet. Vietnam has almost 16,000 species of plant, and more than 10,000 species of animal, 77% of which are insects. South of Vietnam and Laos, there is Cambodia, which has characteristic megafauna like tigers, elephants, panthers, and birds like cormorants and ibises. Cambodia exists at the heart of the Mekong River Basin, and much of Cambodia's flora is dependent on the Mekong's sediment-rich water. The Mekong is a huge river, one of the longest in the world, and it winds its way through all six of the Southeast Asian countries on the mainland. The river has its source deep inside China, high up in the Tibetan Plateau. It runs down through the Yunnan province of China, through the eastern tip of Myanmar, before it runs south and creates the border between Laos and Thailand. As Laos gives way to Cambodia, the Mekong River and all its tributaries pours into the river basin, flooding it in a shallow sea of slow-moving water. This floodplain supports the flora and the fauna of the Cambodian jungles. The terminal watershed of the Mekong reaches across the southernmost regions of Vietnam before finally emptying out into the South China Sea. The Mekong River is the heart and soul of the rainforests here, supporting not just the hydrophilic herbaceous plants and the tropical trees, but more large fish species than any other river in the world. As far as aquatic biodiversity is concerned, the Mekong is the second most diverse river on the planet, besides the mighty Amazon River itself. There are dozens of new species of plant and animal that get discovered every year around the Mekong, although this biodiversity is threatened by pollution, habitat destruction, and urban development. The Asian elephants roam from the Mekong River across Thailand into Myanmar. There were once more than 100,000 elephants here, but 200 years of poaching and overhunting has dwindled their numbers in the wild down to below 3,000. Over 200 years, this is a reduction in numbers of approximately 97%, which is completely unsustainable. Both Thailand and Myanmar have a drier, higher-altitude geography in their northern regions, which is characterized by tropical forests with oak and pine trees, and in the southern lowland regions, 
the jungles are mostly teak, bamboo, and acacia. The southernmost regions of Myanmar and Thailand reach down along a thin peninsula until they come to the border of Malaysia. Malaysia is a really interesting country because it's split into two parts. You have West Malaysia on the Asian mainland and East Malaysia on the northern coast of the island of Borneo. Between these two regions on the Asian mainland and part of the island of Borneo, Malaysia holds more than 20,000 species of plant and more than 20% of the world's animal species, including the Sambar deer, the Sumatran rhinoceros, the Malayan tapir, the Bornean bearded pigs, as well as four megafauna species of predatory cat. These monstrous feline death machines are the clouded leopard and the Malayan tiger, and the Indo-Chinese tiger and the Indo-Chinese leopard. All four of these big cats are the apex terrestrial predators, hunting and feeding on the numerous species of boar, deer, and tree-dwelling primate. If they're hungry, or feeling up for a challenge, they'll even hunt larger, more dangerous prey like rhinoceros and elephants. These larger prey animals are very dangerous to hunt because they fight back with horn and tusk. These bony weapons can stab and cut through a tiger's hide, especially when the predator is struck with the force of an angry animal that has a four-digit body weight. The elephants in particular can just crush a predatory cat, should they somehow come close enough to the tiger or leopard that they can charge and trample the predator underfoot. With an elephant's strength and body weight, such a charging attack would easily crush bone and brutally maim, and it would almost certainly be fatal. The mini islands of the Malay archipelago are divided by a very unique biological marker called the Wallace Line, named after the British naturalist who described it, Alfred Russell Wallace. This marker, the Wallace Line, is a demarcation between continental shelves, tracing a deep channel between the Sunda Shelf with Borneo, Sumatra, Java, and the Asian continental mainland to the west, and the Sahul Shelf with New Guinea, Celebes, and Australia to the east. Terrestrial animals, and even many bird species, are unable to cross the deep water strait between the Sunda and Sahul continental shelves, which creates a kind of natural barrier between the animal lineages from the Asian and Australian continents. Indonesia is a really good country to look at when you're studying the Wallace Line, because the islands of Indonesia exist on both sides of the line. Animals on the east side, which belong to lineages that have descended from the Australian continent, include 265 endemic species of bird, 126 endemic species of mammals, like squirrels, mice, and babarusa, which is a distant pig relative with huge curling tusks, and 99 endemic species of reptile, like the giant Komodo dragon and the blind Cyclotiflops snake. Animals on the western side of the Wallace Line belong to lineages that have descended from the Asian continent, including characteristic Asian megafauna like tigers and leopards, elephants, and rhinos. The island of Borneo is a very large island on the western side of the Wallace Line, and it's particularly interesting because it has some of the most unique species on the planet. One such species is the Bornean orangutan, which is endemic to the island, and one of just two species of orangutan that still exist with the other species living in the forests of Sumatra. The orangutans are large primates, and among the family of great apes, they're the most solitary, with social groups consisting mostly of females and their young offspring. And they spend the most time hanging out off the ground and in the trees, on tree branches, in the canopy, that kind of thing. The orangutans are remarkably intelligent animals, with several cultural and behavioral differences that characterize the different population groups. One of these cultural and behavioral differences include the use of specialized tools to gather food. For example, some orangutan populations will use a thin stick to stick inside of a hollow tree trunk. All of the insects inside of the hollow tree trunk will climb onto the stick, and when the orangutan pulls the stick out, it's covered in tasty insects, and they eat from it like a corn dog. 
Some orangutans have also been observed using the same stick technique to scrape seeds out from fruit that has a hard outer shell or a husk that the orangutan otherwise struggles to get off. If you can just scrape out the seeds from the inside, well, there you go. The orangutan can now collect the tasty seeds, and the problem of the hard outer shell that it originally couldn't get past, well, that problem has been resolved. Besides being really intelligent, orangutans are also really beautiful creatures. They have long, reddish-orange hair, which drapes down from their bodies in a curtain of matted ribbons. They have squat torsos with a thick neck and a broad head, but their arms and legs are thin and long, with similarly long fingers. And cool fact about their fingers, the orangutan's hands have evolved to be particularly effective at climbing trees and swinging between the branches. I mean, after all, of all the great apes, they spend the most time in the trees. So the joints and the tendons in their hands have evolved to be arranged so that the fingers naturally curl into a hook. The toes curl like this too, so as to give a naturally better footing in the tree canopy. The orangutans are largely herbivorous, but they'll also eat insects, so they're a kind of imbalanced omnivore. The vast majority of their day-to-day -day diet is sugar-rich, consisting of fruit and honey, sometimes leaves, and occasionally bark. By and large, they don't really eat flesh. The Sumatran orangutan has occasionally been seen to eat a smaller primate called a slow loris, but as far as meat goes, like muscle, that's about it. Both species of orangutan will sometimes scavenge bird eggs for the nutritious yolk, but that isn't a particularly major part of their diet either. A more foliage-hungry primate is the silverback gorilla, which lives in the rainforests of the Congo in the heart of Africa. These gigantic apes eat mostly leaves and the stems of plants, and unlike the orangutans, the gorillas rarely eat fruit. It's actually kind of interesting. Gorillas don't often drink water. It's not that they don't need water, they do, it's just that they eat so many leaves and succulent plants that they get all the water they need from vegetation. Also unlike the orangutans, the gorillas don't usually live by themselves. They live in small groups, or harems, which usually consist of an adult male silverback, several adult females and all of their young offspring, and any adolescent and or subservient males. When the young gorillas come of age, they typically migrate away from their birth group to find another group to join, or they get together with other young wandering gorillas and make their own temporary groups until they can find a more permanent harem or family group. In some cases, a male gorilla may stay with his birth group as he ages, with a strategy to try to replace the alpha male silverback gorilla when the alpha gets old and dies. The female gorillas build strong relationships with the silverback alpha male, as they really depend on him for making group decisions and for defense from predators like leopards. Where the orangutans live mostly in the trees, the gorillas live mostly on the ground. They roam around on all fours, knuckle-walking on their arms through the dense foliage of their native jungles. In the wilderness, gorillas would be roaming around somewhere in the jungles of the Congo Basin, which is filled with another of the world's massive tropical rainforests. The western gorillas live on the western edge of equatorial Africa, with habitats reaching the Atlantic Ocean. The eastern gorillas live on the eastern side of the Congo Basin, near Uganda and Rwanda. Much like the ecosystems fed by the Mekong River in Southeast Asia, the Congo River in Africa nourishes and supports the ecosystems of the Congo Basin. The Tanganyika and Mweru lakes are the source waters for the Congo River, which sit high up in the eastern African highlands. These lakes feed into the Chambeshi River, which becomes the longest among many tributaries that feed into the Congo. The massive Congo River comes into the basin from the south. It meanders northward, and then curdles to the west, and then southwest, before finally feeding into the Atlantic Ocean. The Congo River splinters into a delta at its mouth, creating a massive expanse of floodplains, swamps, and flooded forests in the west. 
These flooded forests, with their high canopies and soaked, muddy soil, are extremely difficult to move through. Large mammals find the foliage so thick as to be near impassable, while smaller animals can run beneath the leaves and through the root systems with relative ease, but they run the risk of getting stuck in massive mud pits or drowning in deep mud puddles. As with most wetland habitats, the tropical swamps support thriving populations of amphibians, of wading birds, and freshwater fish, which all feed in some way on the numerous insect species that live here. Within the forests of the Congo, primates like chimpanzees and bonobos will climb and swing through the canopy, while gorillas will mill around on the ground. As humans, we are all very closely related to the chimps, the bonobos, the gorillas, and the orangutans. We are related more closely to them than to any other species on the planet, with common ancestors that existed quite recently in geologic memory. Ten million years ago, our common ancestors had recently diverged from the orangutans to become the homininea. Nine million years ago, we diverged from the gorillinea, the gorillas, and our ancestors became the hominini. Around six to seven million years ago, we diverged again, our lineage splitting into the genuses Panina, or Pan, and the genus Hominina. We, as human beings, as Homo sapiens, are the only surviving species of the Hominina, with extinct cousins like the Denisovans and the Neanderthals. The genus Pan, however, would go on its own... The genus Pan, however, would continue on its own evolutionary trajectory, and would make another major divergence around one million years ago splitting into the chimpanzees and the bonobos. Thus, we are equally related to both chimpanzees and bonobos, so any pessimistic, cynical comment on human nature that's made through a comparison to chimps must also take bonobos into consideration. The chimpanzee and the bonobo have many things in common, including DNA that's more than 99% identical. They live on both the ground and in the trees, and they both eat predominantly fruit, followed by shoots and leaves and other types of green vegetation. But the chimp and the bonobo also have a lot of differences. While both primates have extremely complex societies, the chimps generally create male-dominant societies, while bonobos generally create female-dominant societies. These sex-based dominant structures are reflected in the group behavior of each species. The chimps are territorial, and they'll form war bands that go out and kill foreign chimps for encroaching on their territory. The dominant males will try to prevent the subordinate males from getting a chance to mate. The bonobos, on the other hand, rarely conduct violence against each other, and they're rarely so restrictive and punitive. While still organized in a dominance hierarchy, rank and status are less important in bonobo society. Females in both species, in both chimps and bonobos, are promiscuous, but female bonobos really take it to the next level. They are so promiscuous that bonobo males often don't know which child is theirs, so they have a kind of it-takes-a-village-to-raise-a-child mentality. Every male contributes to the raising and the care of all of the young. Bonobos are also very communal with their sexuality. Sex occurs between all manner of individuals. High-status bonobos will mate with those of low status, young will mate with old, females engage in tribadism, males engage in frauding, and orgies are the typical result of the group getting excited, like when they find a new patch of food or a new nesting location. A mysterious species of giant chimpanzee has recently been discovered and cataloged in the northern regions of the Congo Basin, in a region called the Bili Forests. These chimpanzees are called Bili Apes, or Bondo Mystery Apes, and they're huge, taller, and with a larger footprint than a gorilla. The locals call them lion killers, as they're largely ground-dwelling primates that apparently hunt and kill predatory cats like lions. Where the poison-tipped arrows of the local hunters will fell a smaller, regular chimpanzee, these Bili apes are impervious to the poison. They were formally described in 2003, when research teams went to the area to find them. They took pictures and DNA samples 
and learned about their behavior towards humans. It turns out that the Beely Apes weren't necessarily violent or aggressive towards humans, but they showed no fear of humans either. They were not afraid of us at all. And that kind of makes sense, because they're giant, super-strong humanoid organisms that can kill lions. What's a soft-bodied human going to do? I mean, we don't even have claws. We just have these soft little tiny nails. All right, so I've covered the Mekong River and all of the jungles and tropical rainforests of Southeast Asia, and then I talked about the Congo River and all of the tropical forests of the Congo Basin and some of the animals that live there with a particular focus on the primates. And so now it's time to turn our attention to the Amazon rainforest. There are numerous discoveries coming out of the Amazon rainforest, as it's the largest tropical rainforest in the world. The Amazon has 20% of the world's birds, and damn near 10% of all the species in the world, including more than 4,500 species of vertebrates, 40,000 species of plants, and more than 2 million species of insect. Large predators like jaguar and the anaconda creep through the darkness under the canopy, hunting monkeys like the emperor tamarin as they feed on various fruits and leaves. The vampire bats sleep the day away in caves, and then come out at night to bite and drink the blood of larger reptiles and ungulate mammals. Tropical birds hunt for rodents or bugs or amphibians, which evolved crazy defenses in response. The Amazonian bullet ant is named after its terribly painful bite. The family of poison dart frogs exhibits bright, almost neon colors like yellows and blues, and reds contrasted against black stripes and splotches. This vivid coloration has evolved with their toxicity as a warning mechanism. It discourages predators from eating them by communicating the message, Hey, I'm super poisonous! Don't eat me! These dart frogs eat ants and termites that are rich in alkaloids, and these get secreted as lipophilic alkaloids like batrachotoxin and pumiliotoxin 251D. These poisons are insanely strong, with many being lethal to predators like birds, reptiles, and mammals, with the most poisonous species, the golden poison frog, producing a poison of such quantity and potency that a single individual frog could kill about 15 people, about 15 grown adult humans. Alright, well, that's a pretty happy note to end on, don't you think? I believe I've done enough exploring of the tropical rainforest habitats that cover our planet, so with that, I'm wrapping it up. The world's jungles are brutal, ferocious, beautiful places. As the densest, most diverse of the terrestrial biomes, the tropical rainforests form the biological core of our planet. For numerous reasons, their continued existence is critical to the health and the vitality of all the world's biomes. Most obviously, all of the plants in the tropical rainforests grow and photosynthesize throughout the year, breathing in millions of tons of carbon dioxide and breathing out millions of tons of oxygen. These tropical forests are the lungs of our planet, and they're home to more forms of life than anywhere else on Earth. If you like this episode, then hit the like button. If you like all my content, then subscribe to my channel on YouTube, to get more cool biology-related stuff right as I post it. And as always, thanks for listening.